I always wanted to play with Toto. So I, I, you know, that's still on my bucket list. Steve Lukather, if you're out there. Yeah, I was gonna say, would me. Steve Lukather have to be like, never mind, I'm not doing it. Well, Sharky. <laughs> if they needed two, I've seen him with two guitar players, and I do know Steve. So, oh, so there are two guitar player versions of Toto. In a yeah, at one point, at I one think point. It, yeah, it was a couple uh, gigs they had that had two guitar players. Okay, let's manifest that right now together. Toto. Toto for Sharky. It's Toto for Tito. <laughs> Steve Luca, their place call. Sharky. Yeah, thank you. It's going to happen. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. I have one of the greatest guitarists in the game. A lot of people love you, man. Everyone, people hit me up and all that. Sharky's my favorite. Sharky's my favorite. Ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah Sharky. What's up? How you doing, my bro? I'm great, man. I'm doing good. Everyone wants to play with you, dude. Well, well I, I'm I'm honored and, and feel privileged to for that to be uh, a thing. How does that feel? Feels great. Feels great. I'm glad anybody want to play with me. I want to <laughs> play with other people, so it's all you know, it's all great. At what point did you feel like you really had the ball rolling in terms of your uh, your your gig flow and your professionalism and everyone the phone calling you? Um. That's that's a hard question because I'm still like striving to be you know I got, I got my goals so of course of course um, but I think I that's started part of being the entrepreneur musician yeah you an know, artist yeah you can be like oh man I got to this place and if you're content it kind of stays there but if you want to keep growing then you gotta have goals in place yeah um so I'm still not quite there where I want to be um but I think the ball started kind of rolling consistently probably in my um, late teens early twenties mm-hmm. mm-hmm. where do you want to be um, I'm I'm striving to be the full time artist. Yes, you know, um, I've done a lot of work playing with different artists and you know touring, and I love doing that. And uh, I still I don't I think to some degree I would always do it depending on what it is, you know. And, yeah, you know, um, but um, yeah, I'm looking to do a lot more of my own music. Yes, definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. And we love your music. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate I it. Just called myself we, but <laughs> me being uh, <laughs> we being me and your fans. Well, thank you, dude. Yeah, you're an amazing songwriter, man. It's it it's funny because when I when I first discovered uh, your playing, I identified you as just a really prolific. Uh, you know, you could shred. You had like really beautiful chords, and just the way you play. I'm a drummer, you know, so yeah. I can't talk all the guitar talk. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but I immediately gravitated towards like your technical abilities and how musical you made it and everything. And then when I heard your, your songwriting was in general softer, right? Really beautiful, uh, melodic. Were you originally more of a shredder and then you kind of grew into this artist that you are now? Um, I would, I would say so. I mean, I think I was definitely more of a musician first. Yeah. Um, that, Wanted to be like George Benson, and yeah. Then, you know, be like Steve Luke with there and Frank and Bali and all those guys, and I and I, you know, transcribed and checked out all of that stuff. But then, you know, as you, I don't know, progress in your knowledge of music and your your experiences expand, playing with different artists and different genres and stuff, you start really having to pay attention to songs, yeah. And opposed to just like sections that you like and you want to transcribe and use the licks to, you know, or ideas or whatever concepts to apply to your music. So when somebody says, oh, man, he's a badass or he's, you know, when you're younger, you think about that stuff. But then I think, um, um, you know, at some point you want to play music and actually tell a story. Yeah. And so in your playing, as well as if you're a singer um, or a composer, in, in your compositions as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, obviously you're very known for playing with D'Angelo and playing with John Mayer. Mm-hmm. Um, so did playing with them rub off on you in terms of your growth as a songwriter? Absolutely. Um, I was a fan of D'Angelo since I was probably 10 years old. Yeah. You know, and so I, then I was listening a lot more to his, the, just the music, you know, just, the groove and 
trying to check out who's playing on the albums. And then once I had to start kind of like playing and singing a little background with them, I had to yeah. learn the words and um, checking out the lyrics and stuff like that. And then, of course, uh, John Mayer, he's a great songwriter. I, you know, I, I um, think that he's like like a Paul Simon to me, you know, with his, with his writing. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, a lot of their songwriting rubbed off on me. A lot of their approach rubbed off on me. And, uh, I, and, and everybody else that I've ever worked with, I think, you know, all of the experiences help kind of put uh, a gumbo together. Yeah. You know, you know, where you can get all these different flavors and stuff, you know. Was it surreal for you to start working with D'Angelo and to have Chris Dave and all the people you were listening to from back then mm. become your peers and calling you for gigs and then Chris, of course, calling you for even his solo stuff as well. And now you guys all being peers. Yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely a trip because, yeah. you know, you grew up, I think the first time I seen D'Angelo on TV was on the Chris Rock show. And it was, it was Pino, Palladino, it was um, Amir or Questlove, yeah. uh, James Poyser, Anthony Hamilton, uh, singing background, Shelby Johnson. And then, um, uh, I said Pino and then, uh, Spanky. Yeah. Spanky Alfred. And they were playing, and um, I was I was blown away by that. Yeah, I was just blown away. And then to look up and you're on that side where Spanky was sit, standing at, you know, it's like wow, this is crazy. And then there's Pino. And then yeah, there's, you know. So yeah, it's a trip. It is a trip, uh, and I, I I don't take it for granted. And yeah, it's a blessing. Was that your ultimate dream gig? Did you already get your dream gig? Well, that's one of them. That's one of them. I still have dream gigs. What else is on there? Um, well, I got a call to do a Stilly Dan project with Donald Fagan. <laughs> that was like my ultimate. Ooh. Um, but um, for whatever reason, we had to postpone it and then it ended up not happening. But yeah. Donald Fagan called me to yeah. do, do a oh, session. Yeah, man, you got the call. Yeah, so I, at least I got the call. I got <laughs> the his recognition number. recognition was there. Yeah, I got his yeah. number. So I'm like, if it, if it got that far, it'll, it'll happen one day. And if not, that's enough for me because I'm like, I was considered. Yeah. Um, um, I always wanted to play with Toto, so I, I, you know that's still on my bucket list. Steve Lukather, if you're out there, yeah, I was gonna say, me. would Steve Lukather have to be like, never mind, I'm not doing it. Well, Sharky, <laughs> if they needed two, I've seen him with two guitar players, and I do know Steve. So, oh, so there are two guitar player versions of Toto. In a, yeah, at one point, at I one think point. It, yeah, it was a couple uh, gigs they had that had two guitar players. Okay, let's manifest that right now together. Toto. Toto for Sharky. Yes, Toto for Tito. <laughs> Steve Luca, their place call Sharky. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. It's going to happen. I hope so. Yeah, I think it's going to. I think we're already on the way. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's just some of the stuff I wanted. I always wanted to play for Keith, Keith Jarrett, you know, playing jazz. And I've never yeah. seen him play with a guitar player. Before, right. Other than his small stint in, uh, well, short stint in uh, playing with Miles. But, yeah. you, you know, he, I think he's taken ill recently, so. I don't know if he's doing much playing, but that was something I always wanted mm. to do. Yeah. Amazing, dude. Yeah, yeah. How did you get the gig with D'Angelo? Um, I was doing a gospel session in Richmond, Virginia back in probably like 2017, 2018. And uh, in in the gospel arena, they they like to do a lot of like, whenever they do a live recording, they tend to do a live DVD recording too, or at that time DVD. And um, so they wanted us to dress a certain way, but they told us what we had to wear, you know, in the middle of the week during the rehearsal. So me and my guys, we were trying to find some place to get, you know, some, some gear to wear. And so there was like a little strip mall and uh, the clothing store, Walmart, and then like a mom and pop music store. And so, being musicians, we're going to check out the music store of course. first. Of course. So yeah. we go to the music store. We're messing around. And uh, this guy walks out from the back of the store that, you know, it was a door that had, like, that said guitar lessons. So he walks out. It's a little heavy. And he had a guy walking with him carrying his, his case. And I look, I said, you know, I'm being, you know, a jokester. I'm like, it's a, like a fake-ass D'Angelo. <laughs> oh, God. You know, it was this guy look-alike cat. Now, I, I didn't think, I didn't study into, at the time, I didn't study in Google, like, D'Angelo, you know. Um, but I knew all the records, and I yeah. knew who played on what, you know. Um, 
And uh, so I didn't know he was from Richmond. So I'm like, wait a minute, that that's, he looks a lot like him. So I went out of the store, and I said, I don't mean to bother you. Are you D'Angelo? He's like, yeah. He's hesitant. He's like, yeah, I am. And I told him I knew Spanky. And I told him I you know, love his music, obviously. Thank you for your music. And that was it. Yeah. And he was like, I was just thinking about Spanky in the store, and, man, I, I was taking lessons in the back, and I was talking about him, and I, I felt like I felt his presence or his spirit because he had passed on by then. Yeah, yeah. He's like, but I heard some guitar playing, and it reminded me of him. Was that you playing in the store? I said, yeah. We go back in the store, and I started playing. He's like, give me your number. No way. And then he got my number. Now, what's funny is um, he got the wrong number. He put the wrong number in his phone. And so I was, like, freaking out, called my brothers, like, yo, D'Angelo, hit me. You know, he, he wants me to, he, he wanted my number. I get home, maybe two weeks pass, nothing. And then I get a call from the store in Richmond, no. and they said that he came back to the store to get my number. No way. Yeah. He really wanted to find you. He came back to the store and asked for, for my number if, if somebody can get in touch with me. And so they got it. Somebody at the store knew somebody that was in the band. Got it, got my number, and then he called me, and then asked me to be a part of his band, and that's how it started. So you literally stumbled into D'Angelo's local music store in Richmond, in Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. where he happened to be taking guitar lessons. Yep. And he heard you play, mm -hmm. thought someone sounded like Spanky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got your number. Got it wrong. Wanted to reach out to you so bad that he called the store yeah. to to get dude. That's fate. Yeah, it is. It's it's divine because you know even before that, um, I had met Spanky, um, probably two years, three years prior, and me and him hit it off really well. Like you know, there there's a workshop in the gospel industry called the uh, GMWA that happens in Texas most yeah. times. That year it did, and I ran into Spanky and. You know, me and Spanky ended up shedding together in his room. It's awesome. And uh, very similar, you know, uh, tastes in yeah. music. And so we got we got really close. He ended up passing. Then a year later, that's when I met him. Wow. So it was just, it was just like, wow. It was like, almost like a, a ushering in of something or like a you know, preparation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Energetically, like, mm -hmm. handed it to you. Yeah. So D'Angelo calls you. What does he... What does he offer you? He just he just mentioned a whole bunch of guitar players that he liked, and uh, he said, "Yeah, well, you're my guitar player. I want you to play. I'm working on an album, and I, I want to eventually tour." And and that's what happened. It and that was Black Messiah. That was Black Messiah. No and, way. Yeah, I was about 19. Yeah, and um, we went in the studio. Maybe a year, almost a year later, because after that call, I and mean, he would check up on it here. We, we Almost actually, a year later. Yeah, before I actually did the recording. So it's over that year, did you see him at all? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. um, we talked. Um, I saw him once. We ended up having another gig in Richmond, Virginia, doing a gospel quartet gig at a small storefront church. And uh, it was fun. You know, So we got so a chance cool. to jam. And That's so cool. Jackson Southern Airs mixed with like fishbone arrangements <laughs> that he put on. It was like, it was great. It's actually some of it on YouTube. That's cool. It's called The Soul Disciples. And, uh, yeah, then just under a year, we, we uh, went to the studio and started recording the studio, you know, the song, the, the album. That is awesome. We started out with three songs, yeah. Wow. Your life changed. Oh, man, it was it was beautiful. And, yeah. you know, it was, I had had a gig prior to that and did some gigs. Like, I was with the Isley, Isley Brothers before that. And that was, like, my official first R&B gig. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, I ended up leaving there and, did more sessions and stuff, but then that happened. It was like, wow. But that's how, like you said earlier, that's how I got in contact with Pino. And that's how I got in contact with Chris Dave, thus Robert Glasper. And yeah. it just kept going and going. I mean, that's all of a sudden they became your peers immediately at yeah. such a young age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's your, you have such experienced uh, musicians and, and artists yeah. surrounding you. Yeah. Like clearly your chops were there and you had, the mentality to be able to uh, even vibe with D'Angelo on that level outside just mm -hmm. your guitar chops, but you had the, the spirit on that level. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that's your gig. That's so crazy. And you just like, it's like one of your dream gigs. It's one of my dream gigs. Yeah. It, it's, you were prepped for it already. You spent yeah. years 
Just prepping. listening. Yeah. Just listening and vibing with the albums and stuff like that. And I had heard, you know, uh, Chris Dave on stuff. And I heard yeah. Pino on different things. Yeah, oh yeah. And then eventually through Chris, you know, doing gigs with Chris, Robert Glasper came in the fold. And I was listening to Rob. Rob I remember um, being, I used to play a jazz club when I was like 13, 14 years old. Yeah. And this guy whose name is actually Christian McBride, but he's a sax player. Um, he was like, yo, check this album out. And it was a burnt copy of In My Element by Ross. Who was Robert Glasper? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Just like, you know, somebody else said. Right, and, right. <laughs> more recently. More recently. You didn't and say who the F is. I did not. Yeah. <laughs> I did not. I said that after I listened to it. Like, yeah. I think it was more fair for you at the time to say Yeah, that. I mean, because it was out of amazement. But yeah, like, yeah. The, uh, but, <laughs> but I started transcribing his stuff on keys and nice. stuff like that. So it was, it was just like, even before that gig, it was, you're right, it's just a lot of prepping. Yeah. It's a lot of prepping without even knowing yeah. the divine movement. Because by the time, like, if you weren't 100% ready in that moment, when D'Angelo heard you playing from the other room, he wouldn't have resonated with you like that. Mm-hmm. So it's not, you didn't have... It's not this thing that you're like, oh, I can prepare. In the f-. It's like you were already there. He heard you and thought. Yeah. He had the thought immediately of, I want this guy with me. This could be the right guy for me. Yeah, I think I think um, a person can accumulate so many chops. Yeah. Um, but unless you have the spirit for it. Yeah. You know, um, the, the like-minded. You have to be like-minded. Like a lot of the artists aren't just like chop heavy or just like, you know, accumulated knowledge and that's it. Yeah. You know, there has to be a certain level of understanding and sensitivity with the music and, uh, uh, dedication, not just musically. Yep. But with the spirit in the mind of it, not trying to get deep or anything, but no. just that, I think that's what people hear more. So, cause I don't think I'm like, I didn't think I was like so ready, like, you know, knew everything. I mean, 20 years old, 19 years old. So you still got a lot to learn. And I'm yeah. 33 now and I got a lot to learn. Yeah. But just the spirit and the willingness to be open and sensitive enough to be able to learn and also hear yeah. and feel the intention behind the music. And I 100%. think that's what they, they, I think people will feel that before the chops. Yeah. Amazing. Especially artists like that, you know, so much feel. Yeah. Yeah. And especially how it uh, sculpted you as you existed in it with them. Mm-hmm. Having that as your rhythm section with you and the artist and the vocal you're following and everything. Yeah. Like yeah. talking about playing with an album. <laughs> and then, you know, you're actually playing with within it. You know, it's, it's a but whole it's amazing thing. that you went straight to the record, making the record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which a lot of times, you know, people don't get the opportunity. They just no. play for the artist. You after play for the, the artist and then maybe you never get the call to do. The yeah. record because you're thought of as the live person. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, yeah. But you going in and having to uh, have a musical palette that you create on. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the artists allow you to be creative. Yeah. You know, they have, a, you know, a great idea in mind. For sure. And sometimes even specific lines and stuff like that. But them wanting to get your input and your feel on the album is super important. And I, I thought that was a tremendous blessing and opportunity to do that yeah you know so were you the humble kid in that room were you quiet were you just like i'm, uh, gonna, I'm gonna soak this up and learn or were you cocky or were oh you? no not cocky at all <laughs> man. i don't I, I don't think i've I think i've ever gotten to the point where i was cocky <laughs> um because every before every gig I'm, I'm a little nervous yeah you know yeah um, and I'm, I'm hard on myself because i like to make sure that i'm more than on point and and you know once I know all of the technical parts of the music, now I want it to feel good. I want it to mean something. Yeah. And so I'm I'm very you know hard and anal about that. Yeah, yeah. You know personally, but for sure I was. I mean, I I I was like how I am now. I'm maybe a little more outspoken, but quiet, but a jokester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like to joke around and and have fun. You know, sneaky. For sure. Yeah. I could see that in the energy of, I would love to talk about Sharky verse. Oh yeah. So you tell us about Sharky verse. I know that's the the newest thing, right? Yeah. Um, Sharky verse is um, basically I'm creating, well, I've started to create a community of um, a place where guitar players and eventually abroad, you know, other instruments um, can go and actually get information that they've been wanting. Um, I thought about like how I was, um, 
and still am a fan of George Benson and yeah. a lot of guitar players who eventually end up becoming my friends. But but um, wanted to ask them questions and not being able to, you know, you see, you know, see clips of them, you hear albums and you're wondering like, am I doing it right? Am I playing exactly the way they played it? Or what was the intention and why did they play it that way? And, and also just being able to get insight from those people, it, you know, it motivates you. For and sure. So I wanted to create a place where, um, maybe someone might have feel that way about me or eventually it might, you know, spin off and go, you know, add a mono neon or add these other people to say, Hey man, you know, come apart, become a part of it and people can learn stuff like that. You know, um, and there's a lot of platforms that are out there that's like that, but to um, I, I thought it would be really cool for an artist or a musician to have their own and do it themselves. So it's a place where they can get tutorials and lessons and advice and all those different things like that. I love it. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. Yeah. You mentioned Mono Neon. Yeah. We're currently in Paris, France in my hotel room. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Prepping for tomorrow we got the Jam Jam mm-hmm. with yourself and Mono Neon. Yeah. And Larnell Lewis and mm-hmm. uh, Ibrahim Malouf. Yeah. It's going to be sick. It's going to be fun. Yeah, how do you feel about it? I feel great. I got to I gotta uh, finish going over some music. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some music to learn. But it's all structured it's all, improv. It's all, stru- it's yeah. all good, you know. Yeah. It's all good, you know. That's that, it, that, that keeps me on my toes, too. Yeah. So I like it. And I love all the guys that we're playing with tomorrow. So Mono is like, you know, the happening bass player for me. For sure. Yeah, he's, he's he's bad. He can do all the crazy stuff, but then he he knows how to lay in. You know, he's he's a a bass player for real. You know, an artist. Yeah, definitely an artist. I I'm really excited for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be cool. It's gonna be Band cool. is crazy. It's gonna be cool. Band is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Have you played with Larnell before? Uh, we jammed together. Not okay, okay. not an official gig. Right. Um, me and Mono have done gigs together yeah. and jammed as well. So. Yeah. We already what about uh, Ibrahim Malouf? We never um, played together like that. I think we might have maybe jammed. Yeah. But yeah, never never official gig. Oh, dude, it's going to be special. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, we will see. That, I mean, that was the whole, you know, one of the important things of the Jam Jam is to keep you on your toes mm-hmm. and to not be this perfectly polished show that you see 30 times on the tour. Yeah. To have it be the, oh, no, this is where you can really be you, be yourself, mm-hmm. do that, feel like, feel, I guess, like young and you're playing again or whatever it is, but to have a, an audience. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Have an experience on stage that's giving yeah. everybody else an experience. Have you been to a Jam Jam before? Never. Oh, dude. It was my first one. Yes. Yeah, yeah I know you hadn't played in one, but I was I was yeah. wondering if you had, had been to one. That's exciting. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so. You and Larnell, too. Yeah, Larnell hasn't. I don't think, he. I know he hasn't played in one, but I don't know if he's, Attended one. Yeah, it's my first one. So I'm sure it's great. crazy. It's gonna this be great. one of my favorite venues too. So it's cool. yeah, man, I'm so new excited morning. at New Morning, and you know we're doing it on the floor in the round. Ooh, not on the stage. That's nice. You know we do the jam jam in the round with like the crowd directly on top of you, so you guys will be on the floor. Wow, in the circle, the crowd will be everywhere. The crowd will be on the stage too. That's crazy. Looking down into it. That's crazy. It's gonna be amazing, That's dude. Amazing. Yeah, so, and. and I went to the New Morning last night. They said they've never done that before ever. So it's the mm. first time that the venues ever even experience that so it'll be new for everybody it's 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 good that's that sounds cool because yeah. you know everybody gets to be a part of it yeah and everybody was like what clothes are they using? yeah yeah exactly so for you as a guitar player and and you know you're an artist and you're a songwriter but at the same time you also have to balance your uh income making money mm-hmm. as uh you know in your artist career being an investment right yeah, yeah. and uh your guitar being the way you you know live mm-hmm. right so, for example, with John Mayer, how do you balance him being the front person and a guitarist, mm-hmm. and then you as well being there to support him, but being a guitarist, even though you clearly are looked at in such in such on such a pedestal for your guitar playing? How do you kind of balance the "I'm here to support this person" and and do that with with John? Well, I look at it as as um. Just what you said is the support is, um, I you know, he called me and hired me to be someone. I feel like when anybody calls you in a, in a, in a musical situation, you are there to make them feel comfortable. And as a guitar player, 
um, who has his own band and sings and have to play guitar. Like if I had another guitar player, I could sometimes do this and sing. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like, well, you know, it's three of us on that gig. So it's DRH. John, it's DRH and my myself. boy. And so for me, it's like, how can I play my part yeah. well enough or so well and make it feel good and, and still keep him, uh, a musician at the same time yeah. where he feels it, you know, he's like, Oh yeah. 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 But you know, balancing that all that it out, I think for me, it's just like keeping an open ear, um, and you know, sticking to my role and not having an ego. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not about that. You know, we're selling out an arena with 30,000 people or whatever. His name is on the freaking marquee. You know, and so I can do a great solo all night long. I could be a badass, but they'll be like, okay, that's great, John. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I'm I'm here to be, I'm there to be a, a support system. So yeah. it's taking your ego out musically, um, outside of music, just in general, just, you know, he's, and he's an f- amazing guitar player. So I, yeah. a lot of times I'm listening, yeah, soaking up stuff. You know, because he has a different style than I do. And I have stolen a lot of things from him. I can imagine and some st- rubs off. I've stole some stuff from DRH, too. Yeah. You know? And I use it. And I apply the the concepts, you know. So um, it's a combination between all that. That's how I balance it out. I'm, we're all musicians, musicians. But he just so happened to be a fantastic, huge artist. And so we just do the same thing we do, in the, you know, when we're playing with other musicians and just listen. And, you know, um, support each other. Yeah. Make it feel good. You know, make everybody comfortable. Yeah. But get on their toes. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting, I feel like, for John Mayer to choose to have both you on stage supporting him and David Ryan Harris on stage supporting him. Especially with John being the character that he is. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Yeah, he's, he's not a selfish guy. Yeah. You know. I think he realizes that, you know, who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, when you, when he's a, a fan of music and he's not, he does, you know, um, when it comes down to the music, is the ego isn't so big, whereas, you know, there's, it's a, it poses a problem. Nobody wants to work with you. Now you have to have people that are not as good as you or, well, you know, on your level or anything. Yeah. Uh, with him, you know, he had a whole freaking superstar band. Yeah. The last tour, you know, he had Greg Filler Gangs, Le- uh, Lenny Castro, Steve Ferroni, Pino. Crazy. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And then he had me and DRH, and he has fantastic two background singers, Tiffany Palmer and Carlos Ricketts, you know, Jamie Mahoverick. Like, all of these people, are, they all have worked with so many other people. <laughs> yeah. For the same reason. Yeah. Because they're... Amazing. So many cr- across generations. Yeah, generations yeah. and genres. You yeah, know, just, yeah, yeah. just, and they're all, they all are great at everything. Yeah. And so I think for him in his mind, he's like, well, you know, I got to kill a band. Yeah. And if I got to kill a band, I got to kill a show. Yeah. And so that makes, at the end of the day, it makes him look great. Yeah. And it makes him feel great. And it makes us feel great. For know? sure. Because we're, we're all in it basically for the music and, you know, obviously, you know, we got to pay bills and all that stuff like that. But we're in it for the music. That's why we do what we do. You for know? sure. So why not have a badass band? Yeah. It's quite the all-star band. I, yeah. I would want a band that's that can do anything or more than what yeah. I can do because that'll push me to become better. Okay. So Isaiah Sharkey's solo album comes out. The, the, the next one. Yeah. It blows up. Mm-hmm. Who's in the band? Well, I got some guys in Chicago that I am very loyal to, and they are great musicians. Uh, Tim Trippett, who's a awesome keyboardist. Um, Eric Johnson on drums. Um, Maurice Fitzgerald on bass. Um, and uh, that's just the core band. Yeah. But, you know, then I got some other guys that, you know, Richard Gibbs and L.A. Williams and Markwell Jordan and Slick J. Adams that are all in my band. Nice. And so it's all Chicago people that, you know, um, some haven't toured as much, but should be touring. Yeah. You know, um, and I just want to be the guy that, that, that has his home base. You know what I'm saying? You're the platform for it. Yeah. Well, Do you always see yourself staying in Chicago? No, 
not necessarily. I think that'll always be home. Yeah, that's uh, what I mean. Yeah, right? it'll always be yeah. home in, in my heart, whether I live there or not. Oh, but yeah, yeah. but um, I always I think I always have a residence there. Yeah, you know. But um, yeah, I've, I might move somewhere else just to see what it you know what it's like because I've always been in Chicago. So mm-hmm. Chicago food game though. Oh, it's, it's on point. I think it's the best in the in the U.S. It is. Yeah. I, and I won't talk about different cities and things that they say they make better than Chicago because they don't. <laughs> as a as a very proud Angelino, born yes. and raised in Los Angeles, yeah. and a strong food game in L.A. Yes, Chicago is my favorite food city. Yes, I mean because I mean every every style of food or type of food oh. is just really really good. It may oh. not be the healthiest, but it's really good. It's most likely not the healthiest. It's most likely not. <laughs> and they're actually getting a vegan game up too. I mean, they, they got to support you. Yeah. Come on. You're representing Chicago. They got to hey, get the, the vegan game up. Got to. And it's, it's it's pretty good. The meat game is quite strong. It is strong. It is. <laughs> and trust me, I have tried all of it. Yes, yes. I've tried all of it. All the spots, all the beef places, all the, you know, Italian beef and the combinations. And then you have the pizza puffs and you have the famous Chicago hot dog. You have the Chicago pizza. I mean, and even some of the, I mean, the. Tacos, Mexican. Oh my, it's just incredible. Some Indian restaurants is beautiful. Ethiopian restaurant, killer. Everything. Yeah, I get excited when I think about Chicago food. Yeah, I also get excited about. And the skyline is great. And skyline is beautiful. Yo, May June in Chicago, riding the bike down the park, looking at the skyline. That's is that's like I think one of the best moments you can experience in. In the States. Period. Yeah. Period. Period. And it's, you know, great if you they got, you know, um, quick fast food restaurants. If you want like a, a sit down restaurant that's like really nice and bougie, you can do that. <laughs> and then you got bars galore, you know. So, it's, it's, so you know, you got a little bit of everything you need. Absolutely. When I watch you play, I feel like you're really tapped in. How, how did you get to that point? How long have you felt like you're there? Do you feel that way as well? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think um, I had to live a little bit yeah, to, to get there. Um, I've always felt connected to the music spiritually because I grew up in church. and yeah. Um, so there was always a level of um, the spiritual aspect of it. Yeah. Um, but when you have life experiences and you, you've traveled and understand the great ups in life and then the yeah. downs and all of these different things. Um, you learn appreciation for it. And so um, for life and then everything that life covers, which yeah. is music too. Yeah. And so um, whenever I'm on stage, I'm, I'm grateful for my, all my experiences, the good and the bad, yeah. the ugly, the great. Um, and I take those things with me, you know, or whatever I'm dealing with, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm just like to be honest yeah. on stage as well as I'm honest off stage, you know? Um, so it, 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 it's a, it was a gradual thing and I'm still working towards it. I want, I'm always searching for that moment of being completely just vulnerable on the stage. Cause I think that's what people need to feel. Yeah. Is the person's, uh, spirit in their heart. And so that's the point of us existing is, is everybody is, um, should be effective yeah in the world instead of just impressive yeah you can see somebody and be like you know oh they were killing yeah but when you go away and you you take something like a feeling away you take a a, a experience away you know i think that's important so i always strive for yeah. that even more and, and it's been happening a lot more um lately than it's ever been nice. especially if i'm playing music that i you know right you can really lose yourself yeah. Yeah. You know, because you're not, you're not uh, confined into a certain, uh, you know, I guess, part or right role. You know, you still have your role, but it's a lot more free because yeah. it's your message that you're putting out. And so I hope to do a lot more of that, you know, more consistently. What is some advice that you have for uh, aspiring musicians? Um, just to be open minded, uh, learn as much as you can. Um, don't let anybody tell you that YouTube's bad. <laughs> it's 
not bad. It counts. It counts. Lots of education just, in there. Just just use it the right way. Yeah. You know, um uh use your ears. Don't forget your ears. Um be professional, learn the music business. Yeah. Have integrity. Yeah, but these are all those life qualities too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Um uh and and just, you know, do your best and try to try to be you. Like, you know, it's it's uh, God know how many people in the world, you know what I mean? And we don't need duplicates. Yeah. You know, we need you yeah. we need to hear what you have to say. And that's how you get in the book. That's how you get in the history book. You know, we don't need, you know, we, we have yet to see two Martin Luther Kings. <laughs> he mm. might have been having the same purpose, the same mm. cause, you know, but did different things and stood on their own two feet and, and you know, fulfilled what they had to fulfill. And that's why they're able to put a stamp in history. Yeah. Just like a Charlie Parker or Art Tatum. You know, I feel like Art Tatum is probably one of the greatest pianists I've ever heard in my life. Mm. Um, and he passed in the fifties yeah. and, and, and I still haven't heard anybody that play like him. Yeah. There's no diss to anybody that's out now, but it's just, he was so original. Yeah. You know, it's not about the ability because there's guys that have the ability. Um, but, the originality that he had, you know, the honesty that he had in his, his playing, he could get up out the grave now and play and be just as bad as in 2023. And then be like, okay, I'm going to lay back down now for another yeah. years. <laughs> and we'll come back and we'll still stand up. Yeah. Because it's just the honesty and that'll never happen again. Not that mine, you know, maybe the, the skill level. Yes. Mm. Um, but the, that mind, you know, uh, you look at Coltrane. I mean, how many people have done that? How many people have been like Miles? Where mm. You actually take the music and move it, you know, to a different direction. Yeah. You know, we need we need more of that. Yeah. And, and we have that, but we need more of it. Yeah. And we can. Who knows what happened if everybody just start being honest with themselves? You know. So I, I would. That's the advice I would get. Uh, tell people: just be honest with yourself. Be professional you know, move in integrity and try to be effective and, and uh, you know, be uh, what's necessary for you to be mm-hmm. as well and in the music world. That's beautiful. Yeah, man. Well, thank you for joining me today, man. Absolutely, man. Excited to be in Paris with you. Very. Let's get you some vegan food. Yep. Or some, a little bit of fish. A little bit of fish. A little, a little bit. A little, little, little Nemo. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah Sharkey, everybody, check out the Sharkey verse. Get in it. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.